Mr. Plaintiff's attorney is Mr. Simmons, S-I-M-M-O-N-S. -M -M Defense attorney is Mr. Moreno, M-O-R-E-N-O. -E All right, starting off the court and then question by defense attorney. Defense attorney's questioning attorney. Ready? <clears throat> On the case of Steve Lang, let the record reflect Mr. Lang is present and his attorney, Mrs. Russo, is on the stand. Mr. Moreno, you're cross-examining. Thank you, Your Honor, and I think we're at the stage where she says she reported it to the police department, San Jose Police Department, after work at 5 p.m. on Wednesday. Is that about it, Santa Clara Police? I got SC Police right here. Go ahead. You indicated that when you got home, it was around 1 o'clock or so, and that your husband was asleep. Why didn't you wake him up to tell him what had happened? I was very upset. Now that was the only reason, and I don't think the reality of what had happened had really sunk in yet. Isn't it a fact that you were afraid to tell your husband what time you got home? No, that's not correct. Now, the following morning, did you tell him what time you had gotten home? Yes. You testified that when the defendant pulled down your jeans, he pulled them down to your knees or something like that. Is that correct? Yes. How far down were your panties pulled? Were they exposed in your private areas? Yes. Were there any bruises on your body when you got home? My back was hurting. My head was hurting. My shoulders were very stiff, but no bruises, no. I didn't feel that it needed a doctor's attention. One other thing that I'm concerned with, you indicated that when you ran away from the table, you were being held down by the defendant. You sat down about six feet from the door, and then the defendant came over and sat by you. Is that correct? Yes. You both remained seated on the floor talking in the manner that you described until you decided to leave, and then you left? Yes. Now, you also testified that you called the hotline on Sunday. Is that true? It was either Saturday or Sunday. I think it was Sunday. However, you did write a letter. You indicated that you subsequently turned over to Mr. Medina, I believe, on Wednesday. Is that correct? Yes. And you gave a copy of that to Mr. Lang on Wednesday morning. Is that right? Yes. And this letter was typed up on Saturday or Sunday. Do you recall? I believe on Sunday. Now, on Wednesday when you said you talked to the police department, at that point then, you told them the whole incident as to what had occurred. Is that correct? Yes. You indicated that when you came back from the bathroom, you saw a gin bottle and tonic on the table. Yes, you indicated also that Mr. Lang had bought the gin and tonic before you got to the office after you left the bar. Isn't that correct? Yes. But when you went inside the office with Mr. Lang, did you see him carry the gin and tonic? I don't recall. Now, you indicated that the reason you went in was to use the bathroom. When you came back and you saw the gin and tonic there on the table, why didn't you leave at that point since you had already finished the reason for going in? Because him and I were, we were talking, and I wanted to continue the conversation. And the conversation that you had before you went to the office, or the conversation you had after you came from the bathroom. The conversation we had before, before you went to the office, yes. There was no other reason? No. Okay. You indicated that as you left, you ran away. Did you pick up anything before you ran? I picked up my coat and purse that was on the table. Did Mr. Lane try to stop you in any way while you were getting the jacket and of the purse from the table. I think he said stop, don't leave. I'm not sure. What? I think he mentioned stop, don't leave or something to that effect. I didn't hear that. Stop, don't leave. Oh, he said stop, don't leave. Did he physically try to stop from holding you in any way from that point? No. Now at this point you were very much afraid of him? Yes. When he had you on the floor, you thought he was going to try to rape you? Yes. So when you ran, you were afraid that he might continue his assault on you? Yes. Now, you said that you sat down and you didn't go any further. Why was that? I was shaking and crying and pretty hysterical, and I couldn't make it to the door. You didn't trip or fall down or anything like that? I just fell. I just couldn't run anymore. My legs gave out. Now, did your husband at all insist upon calling the police when... You told him about what had happened. We talked about it, but he said the final decision was up to me and whatever I decided he would be supportive. 
May I have this marked for identification, please? Defendants A, what is it? It is a letter that looks typed. Do you say it looks typed? If we could, if we could have a moment, Your Honor. Sure, Mrs. Russo, you testified before that on Wednesday you gave a copy of the letter that you later gave to Mr. Medina or Mr. Lang, yes, showing you what's been marked as Defense Exhibit A for identification. Can you take a look at the letter and see if that is a copy of the letter that you gave to Mr. Lang? For your clarification, you testified that you had torn it, but as you can see, it was put together and then photocopied, yes. Is that the copy of the letter that you gave to Mr. Lang? Yes. And the original you gave to Mr. Medina? Yes. In the letter, you indicate that at this point, it was long past midnight when you got home. My husband was waiting up for me. Do you want to read this paragraph, the next to the last paragraph? Please just read it to yourself. Is this what you wrote, ma'am? Actually, this was a letter that my, that someone else had typed for me after I had wrote the original. I can't hear what she's saying. He wasn't waiting up for me. I think I said, hi, dear, when I came in, but he was sleeping. I told him in the morning what had happened, but in the letter you put down that your husband was waiting up for you. Is that correct in this letter? Yes. And you indicated that he was not only waiting up for you, but you told him what happened then. Did you do that? No, I didn't. This letter is dated January 8, which was Sunday of that particular weekend. Now at that time that you typed up this letter, your memory was pretty fresh on what had happened, was it not? Yes. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think January 8th, that's a Monday. I'm sorry, I think January 8th was a Monday. January 8th was a Monday? I'm sorry, I thought it was a Sunday. You typed it up on the date that's indicated on the letter? I'm sorry, January 8th was a Sunday. Go ahead. I have no further questions, Your Honor. No further questions, just a couple, Your Honor. Thea, I believe you mentioned that you typed up a letter and then you made some copies of it, correct? Yes. How many copies did you make? I believe there were four copies. What did you end up doing with the original? The original went to Mr. Medina. I did not hear you. I'm sorry. The original went to Mr. Medina. <clears throat> and you tore up the copy which you left in the defendant's office. Is that correct? Yes. To the best of your knowledge, what's there marked as defendant number one is the copy that you tore up and left with the defendant i think there were two separate copies that were typed up a little bit different with a little bit different wording and that's what i wanted to explore you mentioned that someone else had typed up the letter for you yes can you explain what you mean by that i had written the rough draft and my husband went through and put it on the computer for me so it would be typed because i wasn't together enough to type it up myself so if there's a little discrepancy then it could be in the translation of what i had written on my original paper in other words, you wrote out your account longhand, yes. That was then entered into a computer, right. And a letter was printed from that, yes. And copies were made from that original, yes. My husband did it all on the computer and printed out different copies. Was it raining that night when you got back to your work site? Yes, it was. Is that one of the reasons why you wanted to wait inside? Object, Your Honor, that's a leading question. Overruled. Yes, it was raining and probably would have been a little rough driving home. Was there any reason why you wanted to wait for a little while inside at the work site? Also, I had probably had a little too much to drink, not to the point where it would impair my driving, but it would probably have been safer for me to wait a while before I drove. I wanted to clarify one other point. When you went back into the work site to go to the bathroom, did the defendant carry in with him what you believed it to be? Any liquor that you saw? I don't recall. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Anything further? Briefly, Your Honor, for the record, Mrs. Russo, we broke up about noon today, and then we started back around 2.45 this afternoon. Between 12 and 2.45, did you discuss your case with the district attorney? No. Did you stand under oath that you did not talk to the district attorney between 12 and 2.45? Objection vague as to what this means by talk about the case. All I'm talking about is the case between 12 and 2.45. Did you have a conversation with the district attorney during the noon break? No. You did not discuss the police report then? Your answer is no. Object. It's pretty clear the witness is confused by what is being asked. I object. It's vague and confusing. First of all, don't be frightened by the question. If you had a conversation with the district attorney, what did you have for lunch? Did you eat lunch? Any conversation you may have had with him, there's nothing wrong with that. So if you talk to him, 
tell us you talked to him. If you talked to him about some subject you remember, tell us what you talked about. The admonition not to talk about the case doesn't apply to the attorney, nor in any way, shape, or form would it affect the attorney. So you can talk to him all you want to, or the police all you want to. The only admonition you had is not to talk to any other witnesses. If you did, tell us. If not, say so. Do you want to change your testimony now? I believe, is this a question pending, Your Honor? Now the question is, do you want to change your testimony now after instructions by the court? Did you talk to the district attorney between 12 and 2.45 about your case? I believe a few words was said, but then I left for lunch immediately. A few words were said immediately right after lunch, is that right? Before lunch, she said. After the break, that's my question. After the lunch break? Yeah, just a few words, that's all. So you did talk to him? Yes. And did you talk to him about what you had said in the police report about the reasons why you had stayed with Mr. Lane? Yes. Now, you indicated that you wrote up the statement as to what occurred originally in your own handwriting. Is that correct? Yes. You said your husband then used those notes to type up the statement. Is that correct? Yes. After you typed it up, did you sign it? I believe I signed it. Did you read it before you signed it? I think I looked over it. Yes. So at the time that you signed it, you were satisfied that what was stated in the letter was correct. There were a few things that I would have changed, but I didn't have the time to change them. But you told your husband that that was a correct statement then of what had occurred. I told him that was pretty close, and I thanked him for his help. When you gave the letter to Mr. Medina, did you tell him there were any errors in there? No, I didn't. Did you tell him that that letter, in fact, indicated what actually occurred between you and Mr. Lane? Yes. Thank you. I have no further questions. Uh, thank you very much. You'll be excused. Call your next witness, please. People have no further witnesses at this time, and we would rest. Okay, people rest. If I could have a moment, Your Honor. Sure. Thank you, Your Honor. Call your first witness. May I go outside and call my witness? Sure. Take a seat there in the witness stand, please. When you are seated, tell us your first name and spell your last name, please. The first name, Lewis. Moss, M-O-S-S. -S. Mr. Moss, what is your job? What do you do? Where do you work? Associate Director at Development Services Association in Santa Clara. And on or about January the 6th of 1989, did Mr. Lang work for you? Yeah, that sounds right. And did Mrs. Thea Russo also work there? Yes, sir. Okay, now on January 7th, a Saturday, do you recall having a meeting in the particular room where Mrs. Russo works during the week? We had a first aid training. About what time did you go into that room? I believe it was set for 8.30 or 9. Okay. And were you the person that opened the door? Yes. Were you the first person inside the room that morning? I believe I was. When you entered the room, did you notice anything unusual? Any papers on the floor? Any tables overturned or chairs upset? No, I did not. Did you see even one piece of paper on the floor that wasn't supposed to be there? Anything at all upset or disturbed? Nothing struck me. I have no further questions, and just a few follow-up questions. Good afternoon. Hi. Since this whole thing happened in January of 1989, the defendant resigned from his position. Is that right? No, that is not right. He talked about resigning. It ended up being a termination by the company. What date was that? I think it was on a Wednesday after that Sunday. Since that date, have you had any conversations with the defendant about this case? Very few. I think they were avoided. Now, the only one of substance that I recall was when he called about something a few days later. I think it was like the Monday following his termination. Yeah, and at that time, he was made aware that someone had approached me about this matter. To your knowledge, has he talked to anyone else in your company about the events of this case since his termination? I think he tried to contact, excuse me, Your Honor. I object to the question unless foundation is laid to indicate it's not hearsay. Okay. Just a little bit faster. I don't want to know what someone else might have told you. I'm asking, do you know from your own personal knowledge that he's talked to any other associates of yours? I'm sure he has spoken to one person, a woman who used to work for us. Who was that? Hope Daly. H-O-P-E, yes. Did you yourself generate any notes or reports or tapes concerning the events of this case? 
nothing except what has already been given to, I don't recall this gentleman's name, Sergeant Medved, yes, I think he's the person uh, that first spoke with me. He and another gentleman. Now, I take it you had several meetings with the defendant after you had contact with him, starting on January 7 of 1989, yeah, as was noted in the sergeant's report, and he told you that he had become involved with a fellow employee there, yeah. I suppose involved can be used as a general term. From the very first time he mentioned it, did he use that employee's name, or did he keep that person anonymous? He kept that person anonymous. How long did he keep that person anonymous? I think when I had the meeting with him and David Wong that he may have mentioned her name. I don't recall it being before that. But up to that point, you had no idea who the employee victim was, right? I have no further questions. Anything further? Yes, Your Honor. Was Wednesday the day that Mrs. Russo gave you a letter? Yes. What did that letter consist of? It was very minimal. I just remember her handing me the note, me reading the note and responding a little bit. Was that letter signed? I believe it was, yes. May this witness be excused? Yes. Thank you very much, sir. Is that for the day? You got it. You're free to leave. Take a seat in the witness stand, please. Try to pull up close to the mic. Speak into it and tell us your first name and spell your last name. Sam Russo, R-U-S-S-O. Thank you. Mr. Russo, you are the husband of Thea Russo, correct. How did you become aware of the incident that she is complaining about today? She told me the following morning. Did you notice what time she got home? It was after midnight, I'd say between the hours of 12.30 and 1.30. And you approved of that? My wife is allowed to go out with friends, yes. And when you woke up in the morning, was she in your bed? I believe so, that's usually the arrangement. Okay, so do you recall what she told you had happened? I object, Your Honor, it's hearsay. It has to do with determining the credibility of the witness. Do you want to ask him some questions just as to the impeachment? What if he says the same things that she said if there's no impeachment? You can ask him specific questions if you think what she testified to was not consistent with what his testimony is going to be. Now, this is direct examination. It's okay then? I don't know how else you're going to get to it by him testifying what she told him, ask him questions about impeachment, if that's what you're going to do. First, did she tell you where the incident occurred? Yes, she said at the office. Did she give you the name of the man? Yes. Your Honor, Your Honor, I object to the form of the question. I think it's proper to introduce statements of a witness for the purpose of showing inconsistent statements if the attorney is asking a specific question. Did she tell you X? I just asked him to do that, but to phrase it broadly and say, did she say where she went? Well, that's not really confronting the witness's statement. Now, that's what I'm saying. Firm it up by consistent questions. We don't have to go through the whole litany of the events that occurred. <laughs> 225, four boys for five minutes. Starts with question by plaintiff's attorney. Ready? Where did you first see him after you had been in that interview room? I first saw him when they brought us upstairs and took off my shirt and gave me a blue shirt. I had a two-piece suit on and they gave me a blue shirt and took everything out of my pockets and took me in the other room. When did you next see the jailer? Where was he? I think they booked me in and then they took me in the other room. After they took you in the other room, where did you next see the jailer? He was standing, they called him jailer, lock him up, and he came over and locked me up. Did you say anything to him? Of course not. He is another officer, as far as I was concerned. You went back into the cell and waited? Yes. Then you had the second conversation? Yes. Who was present during the second conversation? And Detective Franklin, Officer Frost, Officer Gould, and I think there was another one that had on a suit, and Brian Thomas. And I think there was one more detective there. Mr. Thomas was there too. Yes, sir, he was there. Have you ever seen this officer that was in the suit again? Once or twice, I am not sure, but I did see him again, yes. Describe him, I couldn't really describe him. I know he was younger than Detective Franklin and a little older than the other two uniformed police. How tall was he? I don't know how tall he was. He wasn't that tall. He was shorter than you, I think. You saw him standing up? Yes. Was he standing up when you came in? He was leaning by the window over there. How tall are you? Five, six and a half, five, seven, something like that. Was he taller than you? Yes. How much taller? He might have been about 5'11", something like that. 
What was your weight on November 23rd? I weighed about 165, 170 pounds. Thank you. And that officer, was he thin or fat? He was stocky. He wasn't skinny. He wasn't fat. Well, was he less stocky or more stocky than I am? He is less stocky than you are. Was he heavier than Mr. Franklin? Yes. Did he say anything ever? Yes. What did he say? He would make a comment like, come on now, Bob, don't be a fool. You know we got you, so tell us. Something like that. Did you understand him? I understood him. And did he have any facial hair? No. Did he wear glasses? I think so. I'm not sure. I would know him again if I see him. What color was his hair? Kind of brownish-like. It wasn't black or blonde. Brownish-like. He was wearing a suit? Yes. Now, did I list everybody you told us was in the room? Franklin, Gould, Frost, and the unknown person? And Mr. Thomas at the time I first walked in? Yes. Was there anybody else that came into the room after you walked in? Yes. Who was that? Sergeant Zenter. And I forgot about the other one, but he has an accent. He was the watch commander. I think it was Cook, something like that. He told me he was a watch commander. He speaks with an accent. When did he get there? About 10 minutes after I was there. Are you sure his name was Cook? I think that is his name. Where did you hear the name? They told me their names at one time or another. They did introduce themselves. Yes, frankly, introduced them. Not all of them, but some of them. Incidentally, did this unknown person smoke? I don't know. Did you ever see him smoke? Not that I recall. Did you ever ask for a glass of water while you were in that room during the first interview? No. Did Mr. Cook ever strike you? No. Did this unknown 5 foot 11 stocky fellow with glasses ever strike you? Yes. How many times? I think it was about two or three times after he had struck Brian. He struck Brian? Yes, he struck Brian first. How many times did he strike Brian? He choked him and he hit him in the head. How many times did he hit him? I think it was once in the back of the head or twice. I am not sure. I take it this is a person other than Sergeant Zenter. Yes, Your Honor. I don't know his name. I have only seen him a couple of times. And he choked him also? Yes, choked him first. How many times? Just once at that time. Did he ever hit you? The same officer? Yes, yes. How many times during the second conversation? I think once or twice. Well, do you know there were so many blows? I don't know. I am not sure how many he did. I am the one that was hit by him. With a closed fist or open hand? Closed. Did he have a stick with him? Just a fist. Anybody use a billy? No. Anybody roll up a newspaper and hit you? No, he used black gloves. You didn't tell us about that. Who used the black gloves? I thought about it when you mentioned the stick. Who used the black gloves? Officer Gould. The first or second time? The second. How many times did he use this the second time? Officer Gould? Yes. I'm not sure how many times he hit him. He was running the show. Gould was running the show. Franklin was running it, but he had to get his in. I don't know. You tell me. Well, he hit me a lot of times. Where did he hit you? In the head and body. He hit you in what part of the body? My right side, rib cage, stomach, and in the chest. Up on the ribs. How high? Right in here. The left side, this is how high it was, about this high. Was it on this side? It was on this side, the right side, Your Honor. He hit you? Yes. What time of day was this? It was the second conversation. I don't know what time it was. I didn't have a clock, but it was in the morning hours. Had you tried to call your daddy by that time? No, they wouldn't let me. I wanted to call as soon as I got there. They had two phones, one pay phone. They tried to call them for me. When did they do that? This is after the second conversation. When did you confess to doing the Tiffany robbery? About the third, somewhere around the third. You did confess to it, didn't you? I was made to confess to it. I didn't know. You did confess to it? Well, yes, or made to do it. We are talking about right now. I want to know, did you confess to it? Well, I told them yes. Whatever they said, I said I did it. You didn't make any statements. He had made statements to me concerning the part I was supposed to have played, and I said, if that is what you said I did, I did it, yes. Is that the truth, that you actually did commit the Tiffany robbery? Now that question is irrelevant in this case, whether he committed that robbery or not. I object to the question. If I may be heard. <laughs> Which one? Z-E-N-T-E-R. Okay. Okay. Start with question. Did you say anything to him? Okay. Mm -hmm. Mr. Park.
Parks, you understand that you are still under oath? Yes. Just to refresh the jury's recollection, please state your full name, Kevin Parks. Thank you. Now, Mr. Parks, did you know the deceased, David Ray Roberts? Yes, I did. I should like to show you some photographs. These are people's one for identification. Do those photographs depict David Ray Roberts? Yes, I have seen them before. Directing your attention to August 24, 1967, did you at some time on that day have a conversation with the defendant, Mr. Blaine? Yes, I did. Approximately what time did this conversation take place? It was in the evening, about 6.30 or 7, I guess. And where did this conversation take place? At my mother's house at 1907 Hillcrest Drive. Did Mr. Blaine come over to that address? Yes, he did. As best you can recall the conversation, would you relate it to us? Well, we were just talking general things for a couple of minutes, and then I asked him if Dave Roberts was going to pay me some money that he owed me, and he just said, well, you'll probably never see Dave or the money again. All right. Mr. Parks, after Mr. Blaine made this statement to you that you'd never see Dave or the money again, did you ask Mr. Blaine any further questions about what he meant? Yeah, I said jokingly, why? And did somebody shoot him? Then he said no, but he's planning to leave town. Did you ask him any further questions about Dave? I don't remember asking him anything else. I have nothing else uh, very well. Mrs. Patterson, you may cross-examine. Mr. Parks, were you aware that Mr. Roberts was going to leave town? Yes, I had heard it from several people. Did you know where he was going? No, I didn't. How much money did he owe you? It was over, it was just over $150. I'm not sure of the exact figure. Are you sure it wasn't more like $1,000? No, I don't think it came to that. And did you know that David Roberts and Mr. Blaine had been living together off and on? Yes. And did you know they were friends? Yes, I did. In fact, at one point, objection, no question pending. Just answer the questions, please. All right. You didn't care for Dave Roberts, did you? No, I didn't. Had you made any threats on Dave Roberts' life yourself? No, not actually a threat on his life, but I was going to get in a fight with him at one time when Jim Blaine broke it up. So you got into a fight with Dave Roberts? No, he didn't say that, Mrs. Patterson. Not into a fight? No, no, but I was about to fight with him. To your knowledge, did Jim Blaine protect Dave, David Roberts on other occasions? Yes, a lot of people were beginning to dislike Dave because he was taking advantage of everyone, borrowing money and not paying it back. Had you ever seen Jim Blaine with any type of gun or weapon? No, I hadn't. Were you aware of David Roberts' dealings with a man named Gary Matthews? I knew they were acquainted. Were you aware or did you know that Gary Matthew had planned some type of...